September the 11th, 2001, at about this exact moment, the South Tower collapsed, killing thousands. And I sat at EMS Base 5 in Davidson County, watching that building collapse, realizing in that moment that many of my brothers and sisters in public safety had just perished, rushing into a building that so many people were desperately, desperately trying to get out of. When I started preparing today, it was not lost on me that I was going to be speaking on the anniversary of 9-11. And I imagine that most of you can remember where you were at on that day. For us, it was the Pearl Harbor of our generation. It had a profound impact on our lives, on our country, on our society. Most of us sat in amazement and awe and disbelief at what we were watching happen. In the days that followed, 9-11 served as a wake-up call for us as a nation that there was a global terrorist, terrorist network that was intent on destroying, destroying democracy and humanity and all things that were holy and godly. And yet we sit 20-some years later, and it would be easy for us to let this day go by and not remember what happened. I opened today with that heavy reality because I want to speak to us today about the reality of the church Because my fear is that for many of us, we need a wake-up call. I'm hopeful that these last few months have served as a wake-up call, as a reality check for where we are as a church and where we are as a people. Because there is an enemy that is intent on destroying all things that are godly, and are holy. You don't have to look at social media long to realize that there's an ongoing debate about what is biblical truth and what is secular truth. We live in a culture that is trying to redefine marriage, it's trying to redefine gender, it's trying to redefine um, stewardship, it's trying to redefine finances, it's trying to redefine family lives, it's trying to redefine what is normal and what is evil. And just like on that morning, when those planes hit those towers, the intent is to destroy the church. And what I want to share with us this morning, I want to maybe challenge us with a reality, equip us with some tools that we can use to combat that reality, and remind us of who we really are. Around August the 24th, I can't remember where I was at, but I was not, I didn't have, I didn't initially have access to social media, and I was busy doing some things, and uh, I ended up talking to um, someone, and they said, hey, have you, have you seen the news today, have you looked on social media today, and I was like, no, I hadn't, and they were like, well, 
the president just announced that um, a plan for forgiving college loan debt. And they're like, social media is blowing up. Now, before we get started, let me just say this is not a talk about whether I agree with that political decision or not. I have no problem telling you I don't agree with that political decision. That's my personal opinion. I'm not leveraging a platform to tell you which way you should believe, but I'm also not going to stand up here and try to muddy the water because my whole point is don't muddy the water, okay? Um, you either in the game or you're not. So that's my position. But I am going to speak to some things that I saw on social media that grieved me as a believer reading fellow believers' post. Okay? So I get on social media and I start reading, you know, back and forth different people's political views on things, but I started um, reading a couple of things on fellow believers' post, and I'm going to paraphrase. And the post went something like this If you claim to be a Christian and you have a problem with forgive, forgiving loan debt, then you don't understand that your entire belief system is based on the forgiveness of a debt that you could not pay. Okay. And I just want to make a public statement that if you think loan debt and the debt that Christ paid on the cross are apples to apples, you need to read your Bible. It grieved me to see the work, the life, and the death, and the resurrection of Christ reduced to a Facebook post comparing to forgive a financial debt that most people, given enough time, could pay back. In the book of John, in chapter 4, Jesus is having a conversation with a woman at the well, a Samaritan woman, a woman who has gone to draw water in the heat of the day. She's there because this is the only time that she can avoid dirty looks, that she can avoid condemnation, that she can avoid... Um, the reality of the choices that she's made. It would not have been common for people to have gone to the well during the middle of the day. You generally did that in the morning and the evening, not in the heat of the day. You, do, you go in the heat of the day to avoid your shame. And Jesus meets her there and he begins to engage her in a conversation and he begins to ask her for water and, and they begin to have this conversation back and forth and she recognizes that he is a Jew and, and she begins to engage him in a conversation and she begins to ask him why he's even talking to her and, and it leads in this conversation. And she begins to talk a little about her faith and she begins to say, well, you Jews say this and we believe this. And Jesus makes a statement that I want to start my conversation today with because this may pertain to many of us in this room. You Samaritans, in John 4, 22, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation comes from, salvation is in the Jews. So he challenged her to go, look, you speak about things and you say things that you do not know. We worship what we know. Salvation is from the Jews. We worship what we know. You worship what you don't know. Now, that statement is actually loaded. If you go read some commentary and do some research, you'll find that <clears throat> just, I'm just telling you this is going to land on some of you. I'm not trying to. I'm, I'm just telling you what Scripture says. They would take certain bits and pieces of the Old Testament, things that, that Moses has said 
and then they would sprinkle in cultural things that sounded good and sounded right and made them feel good, and that's what they based their faith on. Now, I'm not saying any of us do that in this room. I'm not saying any of us take the, 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 the talk of Jesus and the language of the Bible. I'm not saying any of us would dare take the parts of the Bible that we like and not pay attention to the things that we don't like. I'm not saying there's anybody in this room that would take biblical truth and, and take it in their heart, but yet still engage in cultural things that make them feel comfortable. I know that's none of you. It's just me. I get that. But I just want to say that that's what Jesus is speaking to here. He's going, listen, there is truth. There, there is truth that you can know, that you can stand on, that you can be firm on, but you take bits and pieces of it, and then you take other things that make you comfortable, make you feel good, and you mix them together. I've used this analogy before in other things when it comes to politics, but when we do that, Tony Campolo used this expression, when we do things like that, it's like mixing ice cream and horse manure. It doesn't ruin the horse manure, but it sure ruins the ice cream. And when you and I worship what we don't know, when we take part of the truth, and listen, that's what the enemy wants us to do. The enemy wants us to look at something and go, man, I like 80% of that, but I'm going to go ahead and marry this other 20% that makes me feel comfortable together. And listen, what's going on in our culture should be a wake-up call to you and I as a body of believers that we need to recognize that there is an enemy that is here to kill, steal, and destroy. It wants you. It wants your marriages. It wants your family. It wants your soul. And that is the reality of the world that we live in. And it pales, the, the towers falling, the, the global war on terror pales in comparison to the spiritual battle that is going on around us every single day that we are oblivious to because we worship what we don't know. So here's the truth. If you've got your Bibles, I'm in Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. Some of you in here may have college debt. I don't want to dismiss the fact that you may owe hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. I'm not trying to... But, I mean, I own a house that I owe hundreds of thousands of dollars on, so I, I get what debt means. I'm, I'm, so I'm not trying to diminish the fact that, that we have real-life hardships. But when it comes to the truth of the gospel, when it comes to the reality of your depravity, of the condition of your heart and soul, here's what the scripture says about it. Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air and in the, in the spirit who was at work in those who are disobedient. You were dead. You weren't alive and you owed a little bit of money to somebody. You were dead in your sins and transgressions. This isn't a debt that you could possibly have paid one day. This isn't a debt that you could have gotten a second job. This isn't a debt that you could have gotten a good job and paid back. You were dead in your sins and transgressions, separated from God for all eternity. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. You didn't owe money. You were dead, and you deserved God's full wrath. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. 
You didn't have a debt that was forgiven. You had a debt that was paid for by the blood of the pure and spotless Lamb of God. Please don't trivialize the life and the death and the work of Christ on the cross by comparing it to a bank account. Jesus follows his statement to this woman with good news. In verse 23, he says, he's just got through saying, you worship what you don't know, we worship what we know. And he says, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kinds, the kind that the Father is seeking. So what does it mean for us to worship in spirit and truth? Well, first, to worship in spirit means that we care about spiritual matters. That we recognize that there is a, there's a spiritual reality that is going on around us and we care about that. That we care far more about the spiritual condition of our souls and our hearts and our families and our marriages and our loved ones than we do our houses, our cars, our jobs, those kind of things. But most of us, if we're honest, find our identity, our satisfaction, our anxieties, and our worries in the things of this world. We are far more concerned about what our day looks like at our jobs tomorrow than we do our, the eternal salvation of ourselves and our family members. We will spend more time today worrying about what tomorrow looks like at work, what finances look like tomorrow, what clothes I'm wearing tomorrow, than we will praying over our homes and our families. But if we want to be true worshipers, then we put spiritual matters first. We worship in truth. That means that we're obedient to the whole counsel of God's word. So let me unpack for us just a few things over the next few minutes that you and I can engage in and do that will allow us to worship in spirit and in truth. You might want to get out a pen and a piece of paper because some of these are going to be really detailed and hard for you to follow. Number one, we read our Bible. We read our Bible. If the only scripture, if the only verse that you get are the ones that me or Lowell or somebody present on Sundays, it's not enough. It's just simply not enough. I wish I could tell you that it was. I wish I could make it easy for you. I wish there was some way that I, like, like my kids, I could just open up their heads and pour geometry into it. It doesn't work that way. You didn't get into the position that you're in at your job by chance. You got into it because you have experience, you have knowledge, you have understanding. This is the Word of God. Remember, Jesus is the Word that became flesh. This is what He represents. He is the full manifestation of this. And if you want to spend time with Him, read the Word. It became flesh. It dwelled among us. It's alive. It ascended into heaven. It's alive. It's living. And it permeates us when we spend time with it and in it. I'm going to encourage you. I'm not trying to be legalistic. I'm not telling you there's no way to do it. But I'm encouraging you. I love a Bible app. Don't get me wrong. I love it. Jeremy Burleson turned me on to something about a year ago where I didn't realize my Bible app would read the Bible to me. And I love that, right? Like the whole time we were doing Acts, I've got to admit, like, 
like just sitting down and trying to read through the book of Acts, like you're just like, man, some of this is hard. Like I don't like some of this, right? But I, every day I would get up and I'd hit play and I would just let that chapter play and I would do it several times a day over and over and over. Listen, I'm, I'm telling you this because this is a confession that my wife and I need to start doing. We spend way too much time scrolling through TikTok videos at night when we could just hit play and listen to a, a chapter or a verse before we went to bed. But I also think that there's something, there's something awesome that happens when we, when we get away with technology and we get out a Bible that we can hold on to, a Bible that we can write in, a Bible that we can highlight and mark and, and that we can carry We read it, we listen to it, we absorb it. We study the word. We participate in teaching. There are so many amazing teachers and communicators and podcasts and things like that that each and every day you and I could in, can engage in. I have, I have pastors that I follow, and, and when I'm out walking my dog, there are churches that I listen to. There are ways in which you and I can get into the Word and get into teaching. You can find time. You've got car rides. You've got walks. You've got things that you can do. There's no excuse that you and I are not in the Word each and every day. The next are things that we can practice. Spiritual disciplines. I'm not a big sports guy, don't claim to be, but I do know that generally speaking, the team that wins is the team that played the hardest. The team that, that did the hard work, that put in the practice, that, that ran the drills, that ran the plays over and over and over and over until they became second nature. How do we practice? Daily devotionals. I just told you, read your word. Daily devotionals. There's a prayer that I say every morning with my kids and a prayer that we try to say every night. We, we say our prayers every night, but there's a, there's a prayer that we recite every morning over and over. Every kid, I, we speak it. They can recite it. We have a prayer that we use at night. I have those little... Um, we, years ago, we made these little business card size that had verses that had one for the morning, one for the evening. I've got them in two different rooms. I try every morning to read through one and every night to read through one. Prayer. We actually spend time in prayer. I know it seems simple, but we say the blessing at meals. We wake up in the morning with a prayer of gratitude. And preparation for our day. We go to bed at night with a prayer of gratitude and request for rest and peace. When somebody tells us something we, and we say, hey, I'll pray about that, we actually pray about it. Quiet times. We carve out moments in our day to just be still. How about fasting? We intentionally modify our behavior and we give up certain things or we abstain from certain things for a period of time so that when we feel the need or the urge or the compulsion to do that, it reminds us to either be still or pray or something that points our attention towards what really matters. We listen to worship music. One of the best things that we've done in our house is that 
a lot of times at night, Katie and I, when we're cleaning the kitchen, we started, we would just, or in the mornings when we're cooking breakfast, I would just turn on worship music so that worship music was playing when the kids were getting up and eating breakfast or when at night when they were going to dinner. And I found that that through that, they just picked up the habit of doing that. I, I went upstairs last night and my daughter was... Um, was in the, in the bathroom with the door closed, and um, I Speak Jesus was playing. It was playing so loud, she couldn't even hear me knocking on the door. But they're, they're listening to music and singing songs that declare the goodness and the truth and the fullness of who they are and who Christ is in them. Read the Word. Practice spiritual disciplines. This next one is this is hard. Community. You were created for community. God exists in three parts to demonstrate to us that we are communal beings. We were intended to be in community with Him, we were intended to be in community with one another. All right, what does community look like? Well, you're doing it right now. You show up on Sunday morning and you participate in a corporate gathering where we pray, we declare the truth of who God is, we sing songs. We did an announcement about small groups coming up. On the 21st, we're going to gather in here, we're going to do some corporate worship together, and we're going to kind of kick off our discipleship Wednesday nights. You get involved in a small group. Let me tell you why small groups are important. Because you have built-in DDs. I'm not talking about designated drivers, I'm talking about domestic, devi- domestic dispute partners. Okay? I love my wife, been married 17 years. I am a hard man to get along with at times. A couple weeks ago, my wife and I were out one afternoon hanging out with another couple, and uh, we got into an argument about money. And I found out something that I didn't know, kind of caught me off guard. And I mean, literally, like, I. If I could have been like Jesus flipping over tables in a restaurant, that's how, that's how it hit me and landed on me. Now, the husband that was sitting at the table, he and my wife are kind of very similar in their approach to managing finances, and myself and the wife are pretty similar. But immediately, the husband starts like kicking me in the leg, like, just take a deep breath, calm down. Like He's trying to help me understand my wife's perspective. And the wife who understands my perspective is trying to help my wife understand my perspective. And so we begin to have this conversation and it begins to kind of de-escalate things and we get in the car and of course we drove separate so the whole way home I'm like, I'm trying to prove, I'm like on the phone with the bank, like I'm gonna prove my wife is wrong, right? Like you just don't, woman, listen, right? And she's driving, she's in the car behind me doing the same thing. Like, she's like, boy, I'm going to show you. And we get home and we go running in there and we open up the bank account. And I'm like, the bank said this. And she's like, the bank said this. And we open it up and we look and we're going, oh, wait a minute. I understand how you came to that. All right, I need time out. I'm going to go walk. She's like, I'm going to sit back here. And we came together and we talked. And I would love to say that's just one time, but, but that's the beauty in being in community with one another, is that we are able to come alongside one another and encourage and sharpen and love up on one another. That's what small groups just aren't about studying the word, but it's about going through life together. It's about being able to pick up the phone and going, my son's got a nosebleed and we're showing, we're praying and showing up at the hospital or my husband's going to be out of town for a while and I need you to pray for me and the kids or I'm not feeling well, can you come get my kids or hey, I just need you to pray or I just need to share this good news with you. Whatever that looks like, you've got a group of people who are walking through this with you, who are committed to worshiping in spirit and truth alongside of you, who are encouraging you to do the same thing and you're encouraging them and lastly is serving
I want to be cautious because, listen, there, I, I, don't want, I really don't want to hurt anybody here. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm asking you to do more. I'm not, I'm not beating you up for not doing enough. I'm just asking you to do more. And here's what I'm asking you. Occasionally, I will meet somebody, and I will introduce myself, and they're like, oh, I'm so-and-so. My family and I, we've been going here for four years. Four years? And we don't, we're family. There, there are some of you that have been attending here faithfully on Sundays and giving faithfully, and I, I want to thank you for your obedience to be here every Sunday and worship with us and for your obedience in giving back and supporting the ministries that bless you and that advance the kingdom. But you've got so much more to give than just your presence here for an hour and the check that you put in the offering plate. You have gifts and talents and passions. You have testimonies and stories. You have so much more to offer our family. And we have so much more to offer you. And shame on us for allowing you to sit here for four years and not get to know you. But I'm begging you, if that's you, I'm just begging you to take it up another notch. The enemy brings his A game each and every day. But if we're not careful, most of us spend our days sitting on the bench. We just simply aren't in the game. We may warm a seat every now and then. We may sprinkle a little obedience here and there. We're not really in the game. We're just warming the bench. A while back, I used this illustration. The difference between the church is we're not a cruise ship. We're a battleship. A cruise ship is where we sit back, we relax, we engage in gluttony and rest and everything. A battleship is when we put on the full armor of God, we take our position, we pick up the weapons and the tools that he's given us, and we go to war advancing the kingdom like we've been called to do. As the band comes up, I want to close with this idea. The beautiful thing about being in this time is that we're starting to see more and more persecution. And the, and the beauty about persecution is it produces conviction. You're not going to be able to stay on the bench much longer. You're either going to have to get in the game or get off the team. You're either going to have to worship in spirit and truth or you're going to have to worship a lie. There's no, there's no in between. I'm going to close with what I mean by that. I think we've got a picture of somebody up here. Somebody tell me who that is. Okay, I bet everybody in this room knows who that is, right? But I bet nobody in this room knows who he is. You may know him. You may know his face, but do you know him? John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. My sheep, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. You are deeply loved. You are bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. You are raised from the dead and no longer the object of God's wrath. But do you know him? Many of you know my wife, but not like I know my wife. I know her love language. I know her shoe size. I know her birthday. I know her birthmarks. I know her curves. 
I know how she feels and I know how she smells. I know her intimately. And Jesus desires that relationship with us. But if you want quality, you got to have quantity. I'm still learning. But I know this. God demonstrated his own love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ died. May you worship in spirit and truth. May you get off the bench. May you get in the game. And may you play to the full potential that God has called you to. 